notice in the Virginia Gazette, 1848. Runaway about the 20th October last. Will, five feet eight inches high, middling black, well made, and Peter, five feet nine inches. Here's a wife at Little Town. Reward offered to any person who will kill the said Negroes and bring them their heads. $200 reward. Run away from the subscriber. $200 reward. Negro Run away. Slave. Run away from the subscriber. Negro slave. Run away slave. I have heard that so many slaves escaped into freedom along a route that could not be ascertained that the slave owners said there must be an underground railroad under the Ohio River and on to the north. Colonel William Cotton, abolitionist, 1854. When you hear the words, Underground Railroad, do you imagine a train rolling north along underground rails? Do you see poor, shivering slaves being led through trap doors and dark tunnels? Well, if that is what you see, you see the myth. Because the real Underground Railroad was neither underground, nor was it a railroad. Instead, Underground Railroad is a symbolic name for the 200-year-long struggle to break free from slavery in America. And it includes every slave who tried to escape and every free person who helped them along the way. The Underground Railroad was, in this country, the first civil rights movement. Uh, it was the first time, in a major way, that blacks and whites came together. Uh, toward a common goal. They, they showed tremendous courage, uh, they showed cooperation, and most importantly, they showed what was important to this country, the quest for freedom. As Americans, we want to think of ourselves as really priding ourselves on personal freedom and priding ourselves on being willing to help other people achieve freedom. And so the Underground Railroad in that regard becomes the all-American story, the story of those who refuse to accept slavery and those who refuse to accept the denial of other people's freedom. Some of the conductors on this so-called freedom train would become famous. Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, Henry David Thoreau and Harriet Beecher Stowe were all dedicated and celebrated champions of freedom. But for every well-known worker along the line, there were thousands more whose names are lost to history. Men and women who dedicated themselves to providing a sanctuary for enslaved Africans and worked without fanfare for one of the most important reform movements in American history. The mythology of the Underground Railroad revolves around notions that there were really organized uh, groups of people, mainly white, who either went into the South themselves or in some way reached into the South to help runaways into freedom in the North. As in all myths, some of that's true. But the fact of life is that the average escapee started the journey on his or her own and were helped along the way in all kinds of unexpected ways, mainly by strangers. Think about the difficulty of making an escape. I mean, if you're a fugitive slave, there are no maps that you can use. Your knowledge of areas outside the plantation generally not very great. There is danger at every turn. And of course, you didn't want to fail because the consequences of failing could be unthinkable. It was especially difficult for women to make this decision. After all, women having charged the children had additional burdens. 
I mean, it doesn't take great imagination to understand how difficult it is to try to escape with an infant. She felt that she had rather be drowned than to be captured and separated from her child, and nerved with a strength such as God gives only to the desperate. With one wild cry and flying leap, she vaulted over the turbid current, by the shore onto the raft of ice beyond. A thousand lives seemed to be concentrated in that one moment to Eliza. Uncle Tom's Cabin, 1852. No one knows for certain, but it is believed that one way or another, as many as 100,000 slaves traveled the invisible rails of the Underground Railroad. Many made it to freedom. Most did not. But the probability of recapture or even death was a risk they were willing to take. Because for as long as there was slavery, there were men and women who tried to escape. The seeds of the Underground Railroad were sown in 1526, when Spanish settlers brought the first indented servants from Africa to the North American mainland, at what would become Sapelo Sound, Georgia. In 1619, 100 Africans were shipped to Jamestown. Only 20 survived the trip to serve in the brand new British colony called Virginia. And as a new nation was born, so too was a thriving slave trade. When the Western Hemisphere was colonized, it was colonized as a place where staple crops would be grown on huge estates with a stable labor force. Now, for stable, you can read slave labor force, a labor force that was not going to be able to go off and get their own farm and start up. So. Although slavery had existed on all continents in one form or another, it now became a major business. Negroes for sale, a cargo of very fine stout men and women in good order and fit for immediate service. Conditions are one half cash or produce, the other half due January next. Plantation owners deeply believed that slavery was an economic necessity and that the slave trade was its human stock market. Unconditional submission was the enslaved African's fate. To disobey or run away was to sign your own death warrant. We teach them they are slaves, and to the white face belongs control, and to the black obedience. Plantation owner, 1820. How I hated slavery as it fettered me and beat me and baffled me in my desires. In my period of despair, it gave me the power to hate. But in the end, it also gave me the will and the courage to conquer or die. John P. Parker, former slave, 1845. Don't forget that slavery, theoretically, in its purest form, is absolute power of one person over another person. I don't have to tell you what horrible possibilities that conjures up. Life for enslaved Africans during slave time was like hell. Uh, there's no way that we can romanticize it or minimize it. Never having that free will to even think or do for yourself. I, I can't even fathom what that life would be like to be relegated to boy all of your life until you became so old that you couldn't work. So what manner of people are we? What manner of people are our ancestors that they could endure and hope and pray and struggle that a better day would come? Slavery is at the core of what America is. You take slavery out of the American experience, you don't have America. Slavery is quintessentially a shaper of American culture and American expectations. To see fathers and husbands sold away, to be beat, raped daily, to be murdered in the hills and valleys of the southern parts of America, they yearn for a better day. They were fed up. My great-great-grandfather was one of those people fed up 
and he knew that he had to take his own freedom. So what choice was there? Tell old Pharaoh to let my people go. They were involuntary immigrants, separated from family, bound by the shackles of racism, servitude, and enforced illiteracy. It was little wonder that escape was every slave's secret desire. But escape to where? With whom? Would anyone help a runaway slave? Could an African in America ever be free? We think of the route to freedom as running in one direction, running from the south to the north. But it's important to remember that in the 1600s and 1700s before the Revolutionary War, slavery was legal in all 13 colonies and in Canada. And a runaway slave was just as likely to be recaptured or killed in the North as in the South. Right here in the heart of Philadelphia, the so-called city of brotherly love, they sold slaves on auction blocks. There were slaves in Boston. There were slaves in New York City. There were slaves in New Jersey, there were slaves in all through New England. We were programmed early in our schools that all slavery occurred in the South. That isn't true. So for the earliest pioneers of the Underground Railroad, there were very few options. One was to run off into the vast tracts of unexplored land to the West, a journey almost certainly doomed to failure. Another was to flee South into Spanish Florida, Mexico, or the Caribbean. And it was along this route south in the 1600s and 1700s that enslaved Africans found their best and most unlikely allies. The first slaves made their escape southward with the assistance of Indians who already knew the routes, who'd been roaming up and back and forth in that same area on hunting trails and so on for quite a while. Once Africans knew the route, they also made the route back and forth several uh, times all through their lives uh, to get people escaped with them. The Yamasee in Georgia and the Seminoles in Florida, the Shinnecocks, Cherokee and Tuscarora all provided sanctuary for escaping slaves. This was not charity, it was business. Africans had learned English, were familiar with white ways, and were more than willing to scout and fight in raids on European settlers and their plantations in the Carolinas. It was an important and pivotal alliance, but exactly how many former slaves took this southern route to freedom is lost to history. The number of slaves who allied with Native Americans in the 17th and 18th centuries may be unknown, but many of their descendants still live with the tribes they joined more than 300 years ago. In fact, on the General Council of the Seminole Nation today, three seats are held by African Seminoles who are still referred to as Seminole freedmen. To know that there's still African American families in this country who can trace their genealogies back even before the founding of this country is mind-blowing. And Native Americans were not the only people willing to offer freedom to enslaved Africans. As early as 1693, Spanish settlers had joined this earliest incarnation of the Underground Railroad. Spain offered sanctuary in Florida to all African runaways, as long as they were willing to fight for Spain and convert to Catholicism. It is a religious effort, but it's clearly a political effort also to ruin those Carolina plantations and draw off more slaves. And Africans that are strong enough to get there are freed if they become Catholic. And then they become citizens just like anybody else in the community. They get land and eventually enough people so that they have a town of their own Referred to on English maps as Fort Mosa, this was the first legally sanctioned free black community in North America. 
the settlement was abandoned after Spain ceded Florida to the United States. Fort Mosa would have been lost to history forever if not for this photograph. This is thermal imaging from the space shuttle Atlantis, revealing the original foundations of the Fort Mosa settlement sunk into swampland. Today, Fort Mosa is a national historic landmark. The free African settlers at Fort Mosa may have been the first, but they were by no means the last. To the north, the number of free Africans was slowly increasing. In the 1600s, European ship crews included Africans who chose to stay in North America and raise a family. And there were some enslaved Africans early on who were able to slip through the net of slave law. In the 1700s, these freedmen, as they were called, the most minor of all minorities, began to grow through births, freeing by masters, self-purchase, and successful escapes. And from the very beginning, these men and women actively worked for the cause of freedom and the abolition of slavery. In 1769, freedmen joined both sides of what was becoming the War of Independence. Many joined with the American revolutionaries, including Crispus Attucks, a former slave who was killed by British redcoats in the Boston Massacre of 1770. But others sided with the Tories and the British troops. When African Americans fought in the Revolutionary War, think about it here, they fought for a slaveholding nation. Whether they fought for the British, slaveholding nation, or the Americans, slaveholding nation. They didn't fight for slavery. They fought because they thought that the result of that fight would end in freedom. When our family first came to these shores, we came as indentured servants. We weren't slaves at all, and that was in the late 1600s. A hundred years later, we have the Revolutionary War, where the, we, this big battle for freedom. Everybody got freedom except us. We got slavery. And economics dictated that slavery would become concentrated in the South, where cotton was king. Slavery was critical to the Southern economy. It was also critical to the power, political power structure of the South. You know, by 1840, cotton was the most valuable export of this nation, not of the South, of this nation. By 1840, it was more valuable than every single thing this nation exported put together. That's power for you. And as slavery became concentrated in the South, the small numbers of free blacks who had been spread out across the United States began to concentrate in the North. And in the North, the freedmen quickly became vocal activists for the abolition of slavery. They are pushing hardest for America to live up to the sacred words of its documents, of its declaration, of its preamble, of its Bill of Rights. These are the people who are saying to America, if you say it, do it. The Underground Railroad and those people who participated in it tried to make it very uncomfortable for us to be hypocritical. And they succeeded. By 1786, 14 northern states and territories had abolished slavery or legislated gradual emancipation. The boundary between the free states of the north and the slave states of the south came to be known as the Mason-Dixon Line, named for the men who originally surveyed the Maryland-Pennsylvania border. So by the beginning of the 1800s, crossing this line became the goal for most slaves seeking freedom. By word of mouth, through song and story, slaves began to learn that there was a new place where they might find sanctuary and freedom. It was called the North. But where was the North and how did you get there? Imagine yourself a slave on a Carolina plantation, illiterate, undernourished, without a map or even the simplest directions. Which way do you run? And how do you know friend from foe along the way? For the old man is a waiting for to carry you to freedom. Follow the drinking goose.
the layers of meaning within slave song made it possible for blacks to send messages to each other in a variety of situations and black spirituals were essentially all about yearning and freedom according to legend follow the drinking gourd was written by a southern free black carpenter known only as peg leg joe the lyrics seem simple, but they contain secret instructions for a safe escape route north. The drinking gourd was the Big Dipper, and to follow the drinking gourd meant to walk at night under cover of darkness, keeping the North Star in sight. Dead trees show you the way. The line, the dead trees will show you the way, referred to dead trees along the Tom Bigby River. Left foot, peg foot, traveling along. And left foot, peg foot, traveling on, referred to trees that had been marked with charcoal and mud drawings of a peg leg and a foot, leading runaway slaves north into Tennessee. And with every slave who attempted to escape, over time, slaves and those who harbored them came to know this song and a whole lexicon of secret signs and symbols, songs and hiding places that began to make up the disparate lines of the Underground Railroad. There is something referred to as the slave grapevine, which was extremely effective not given access to education and with a extremely limited opportunity to write out directions and thoughts it was important to speak the news keep the news pass on the news information was valuable they knew the disguises they knew the spirituals they knew the codes they knew the knocks they knew who was a riverboat captain all of these things they knew, so it was a very intricate, complex system. If a white man should grasp his ear as a black man passed by, for example, it meant, follow me to a safe house. And there were secret handshakes to identify friend from foe. It's also believed that if a house had a hitching post in the shape of a slave holding a lantern, the house was an underground railroad station. Ironically, the same hitching post that today has become the detested lawn jockey of suburbia was once a symbol by which thousands of enslaved men and women found their way to freedom. The fact is, the South understood, slaveholders understood, that their slaves were resourceful, and that if, if information could be transferred back and forth, it would be transferred back and forth. There were many ways in which slaves could communicate with non-slaves, with people outside the plantation, and sometimes with people outside the South altogether. And those people in the North had a name. They were called abolitionists, which to many was just another name for troublemaker. Feel that freedom train are coming, coming, coming. What we call abolitionism really got started in the late 1820s or early 1830s. The most important abolitionists were northern free blacks who organized the first abolition societies and anti-slavery groups that actively aided runaways and agitated politically. And they pressed and pushed their white brothers and sisters to view it in new lights. In America's first truly integrated social movement, blacks and whites, men and women, formed abolitionist vigilance committees. Publicly, they fought for political change. Privately, they turned their homes into safe houses, stored food and clothing, and negotiated with slaveholders. We have to appreciate the difficulty of the anti-slavery task. Keeping an Underground Railroad going was not an easy thing. It took money. It took bravery. This was all happening in a hostile environment to north of the Polish slavery. But slavery was still economically important to the north. So that the question of getting rid of slavery was 
very quickly a question of asking people to give up their biggest economic investment. It's as if you ask people today, um, what about if for the good of the country you give up the equity in your house? And in 19th century America, harboring a fugitive slave is also illegal. The people who are involved in the Underground Railroad are breaking a federal law. Uh, what they would have, of course, made the argument, and they did it all the time, is that there was a higher law, the law of God. And the law of God says you don't deny help to people who need help. It was dangerous to be involved with the Underground Railroad, no matter what color you were. I mean, there are white people who spent years of their lives in jail. Let every man and woman bear testimony against the system which fills the prisons of a free republic with men whose only crime is a love of freedom. William Lloyd Garrison, 1850. In Boston in 1828, William Lloyd Garrison began publishing The Liberator, America's first abolitionist weekly. Garrison gave impassioned speeches to anyone who would listen, and many who would not. He organized enormous anti-slavery rallies, and it was at one of these rallies at Fannel Hall in Boston that the world was first introduced to Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass was the son of a slave and her white master. Secretly, Douglass taught himself to read and write, which was in itself a serious crime. Then, in 1838, around the age of 21, Douglas fled from slavery in Maryland to New Bedford, Massachusetts. In 1841, he went to William Lord Garrison's convention as a spectator. Emboldened by the anti-slavery rhetoric, Frederick Douglass stood up before the enormous crowd and extemporaneously delivered one of the greatest speeches in American history. The speech was never written down, and we have only William Lloyd Garrison's memory of it to help us imagine what that incredible moment must have been like. I shall never forget his first speech at the convention. In physical proportion and stature commanding, in intellect richly endowed, in eloquence a prodigy, and yet a slave, a fugitive slave, trembling for his safety, hardly daring to believe that on the American soil a single white person would befriend him. The powerful impression he created, the applause which followed, excited my emotions. And I think I never hated slavery so intensely as at that moment. William Lloyd Garrison, 1841. It's almost impossible to, to exaggerate the importance of this man to the movement. Frederick Douglass telling his story brings slavery alive to people who had, in many cases, never even seen a black person before. And so here is a black person who was a slave standing before you telling you his story and he's telling you about the atrocities of slavery he's telling you about how slavery denies basic human freedom to people and human dignity to people that was a moving message the wife of master giles hicks with her own hands murdered my wife's cousin a young girl between fifteen and sixteen years of age mutilating her person in the most shocking manner the atrocious woman in the paroxysm of her wrath, not content with murdering her victim, literally mangled her face and broke her breastbone. So I say, the only true remedy for the extension of slavery is the immediate abolition of slavery. Frederick Douglass, 1845. Douglass went on to write his autobiography and published an anti-slavery newspaper, The North Star. He helped dozens of fugitives to freedom, many of whom simply appeared at his doorstep in Rochester, New York. But while Douglas's home was an unofficial station along the Underground Railroad, his greatest contribution to the movement was the leadership he inspired in others. Conductors along the route whose names are lost in obscurity, but who are no less important in the history of the Underground Railroad. When historian Charles Bloxon was 10 years old, his grandfather began to sing songs and tell stories about his family. 
His grandfather, James Bloxon, and his cousin, Jacob Bloxon, had been slaves who'd run away underground. But like thousands of others who'd fled north along invisible rails, the Bloxons had kept the secrets of the Underground Railroad locked in their hearts until they died. Years later, when Charles was a grown man with a family of his own, he was in a used bookshop in Philadelphia where a ragged old book caught his eye. The cover was torn. I had it rebound since. It said Underground Railroad. And I opened the book up, and there was a portrait of William Steele. And lo and behold, I, the next page I opened to was 488. And I was thunderstruck when I read that arriving from Sussex County, Delaware, in 1858, Jacob Bloxon, George Allagood, Jim Allagood, and George Lewis, they arrived and he told their story to William Still. The author, William Still, was one of the most tireless workers on the Underground Railroad. Nearly forgotten today, between 1840 and 1861, Still and his family harbored more than 2,700 runaway slaves at their home in Philadelphia. Working with whites and free blacks from Florida to Canada, Still developed a loose network of friends who would assist fugitive slaves by foot, cart, and ship. He kept rare day-by-day -day records of his activities. He wrote down the personal narratives of hundreds of fugitive slaves. He copied out letters for runaways who were trying to get word to wives and children left behind. And he then arranged to have those letters smuggled to the South. Dear wife, I now inform you I am in Canada and am well, and hope you are the same, and wish you to be here next August. I am doing well working for a butcher, and will get good wages in the spring. I now get $2.50 a week. I expect you, my wife Leanne, and our sons Alexander and Louis and Ames will all be here soon, and Isabella also. If you can't bring all, bring Alexander surely. Right when, when you, you will, will come. come and I will meet you in Albany. Love to you from your loving husband, Jacob. So this is my family. Documented by William Steele. I felt like a bolt of lightning just struck me. And I couldn't move. I, I was broke out in sweat. Because here documented in this book, this classic, was James Bloxon, and later he talks about Jim Bloxon, the same James Bloxon that my grandfather, his father, was singing about, and I at the age of 10 years old. It was like deja vu. All that went around came around. He was a first-person participant. His contribution to our knowledge is enormous. And he put down names. He put down masters' names. There's a, it's an incredible body of material. And William Still's personal story is no less remarkable. William was a free-born black, but his mother, Charity, was an escaped slave. Before William was born, Charity worked on a Maryland plantation and had two sons, Peter and Levin. She tries to escape with her children. She fails. She is brought back. And uh, after a long time, she determines that she's got to escape. But this time, she makes the decision to escape and leave her children behind. Can you imagine what a decision that is for a mother to make? So she she strikes out she leaves her children with her mother who was also a slave on the same plantation and peter being only six he he was he was crying for his mama granny i want my mama well peter there's a place not far from here called philadelphia can you say Philadelphia, Peter? I, 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 I could say Philadelphia, Granny. Well, Peter, when you get down there, where they taking you, mayhap you find a white man you could trust. <laughs> 
and you tell them you got stole from your mama from a place called Philadelphia. In a paroxysm of rage, Charity's master took the two boys away from their grandmother and sold them to another slaveholder in Mississippi, literally selling Peter and Levin down the river. Thirty years later, a man, frightened and weary, walks into William Still's office at the Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society in Philadelphia. He's looking for his mama. Her name is Charity. His name is Peter. Later, William Still would write of this amazing reunion. After traveling 1,600 miles, almost the first man whom Peter sought advice from was his own brother, whom he had never seen or heard of. He was my long-lost brother, whose history and fate had been enveloped in sadness so long, and for whom mother had shed so many tears. Peter and William hatched a plan to rescue Peter's wife and children still enslaved. During the daring rescue attempt, one of Still's compatriots, a white conductor named Seth Conklin, was killed, and Peter and his family were all returned to slavery. Letter to Slave Master B. McKiernan from William Still. Now, sir, allow me to make an appeal to your humanity. Although we are aware of your power to hold as property those poor slaves, your present humble correspondent is the youngest of Peter's brothers and the first one he saw in arriving in this part of the country. As regards the price fixed upon by you for the family, I must say I do not think it is possible to raise half that amount. But, sir, Will the money be as great a benefit to you as the satisfaction you will find in bestowing so great a favor upon those whose entire happiness in this life depends upon your decision in the matter? Your obedient servant, William Still, August 1851. No reply to this letter was ever received from Master McKiernan. It was an Underground Railroad fairy tale without the part where they live happily ever after. This is the real Underground Railroad, a mammoth, dangerous struggle for freedom that failed as often as it succeeded. But the passengers and the conductors along the line were undaunted. They persevered and began to come up with ingenious escape plans, desperate measures called for by desperate times. Sometimes we think of the Underground Railroad as that thing where people who were free reached out to helpless, passive slaves and lifted them out of slavery. But uh, the slaves were in no way passive in this process. And in fact, uh, in, in most of the cases, you had to get to major northern centers before you would encounter that thing that we think of today as the Underground Railroad. I mean, once you got to Philadelphia, sure, then you could go to William Still's office. But what would you do in rural Virginia before you got to a place where it was even feasible for you to make a successful uh, escape to a place like Philadelphia? Uh, and, and slaves are ingenious in the ways that they uh, concocted to achieve their freedom. The box which I had procured was three feet one inch long, two feet six inches high and two feet wide. On the morning of the 29th day of March, 1848, I went into the box. Having previously bored three holes opposite my face for air and provided myself with a bladder of water, thus equipped for the Battle of Liberty, my friends nailed down the lid and had me conveyed to the express office. Henry Brown, former slave. Henry Box Brown is the archetype for ingenuity and desperation along the Underground Railroad. And ironically, one of the very few escapees known to have actually traveled by rail. Aided by Samuel Smith, a white shoemaker who nailed the crate shut and mailed it from Richmond, Virginia to Philadelphia, Henry Brown spent 26 hours traveling as human cargo. 
When he arrived in Philadelphia, among those present to open the box was William Still. William says he was so bent over he could hardly walk. He said, praise the Lord, I'm just so glad to be free. He had traveled instead of right side up, upside down. But freedom was so important that he didn't care. He was about as wet as if he had come up out of the Delaware. And very soon, much touchingly, did he begin to sing the hymn, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he heard my prayer. William Still, 1848. The story of Henry Box Brown's escape made good reading, an even better advertisement for the abolitionist movement. Brown joined a small group of former slaves, including Sojourner Truth, whose eloquence made them a valuable asset on the anti-slavery lecture circuit in the United States and Great Britain. Henry Box Brown's Richmond accomplice, Samuel Smith, boxed up several more shipments of human cargo before he was found out. He served seven years in prison, but wrote that he never regretted his actions. Just before Christmas in 1848, a slave from Macon, Georgia named William Kraft dressed his wife, Ellen, who was extremely light-skinned, in the top hat and well-cut suit of a plantation owner. To hide the fact that Ellen had no facial hair, they contrived a bandage for a toothache and then a sling for a broken arm to conceal her inability to write or sign documents. Ellen also pretended to be deaf so that she would not have to speak. William pretended to be his master's loyal servant who spoke for him and handled all the travel arrangements. And so disguised, the crafts traveled by stagecoach and train all the way to Philadelphia and then on to Boston. Unfortunately, the relative security runaway slaves were enjoying in the North was about to come to an end. The year is 1850, and the powerful cotton kings of the South are fed up with the growing number of slaves who are making it to the North. So Congress appeases them by passing the Fugitive Slave Act. In 1850, an entirely new law is passed. It's four long pages. It runs hundreds of lines of text. Basically what it does is make the law a federal enforcement issue so that the owner of the slave can now go to a federal commissioner, say my runaway slave is in your area. The federal marshal is obligated to arrest and seize the fugitive slave. There is no jury trial. The alleged fugitive slave is not allowed to testify at his own hearing. And the federal marshal is authorized to deputize anybody he needs to call out the army, the marines, the navy, the coast guard, whatever it takes to get the fugitive slave back. Caution, colored people of Boston, one and all, you are hereby respectfully cautioned and advised to avoid conversing with the watchmen and police officers of Boston, for they are empowered to act as kidnappers and slave catchers. The Fugitive Slave Act was supposed to appease southern slaveholders by making it easier for them to retrieve their runaways in the north. What it did to the black community was send it into a justifiable, deep concern that indeed some of the successful runaways from decades before would be kidnapped and sent to the South, and that people who had never been enslaved, who had always been occasionally kidnapped, would now be caught up in this and taken South and sold as well. Southern slave owners formed posses, or offered exorbitant rewards to bounty hunters who began swarming north, threatening all blacks, not just fugitive slaves, with arbitrary arrest. Conductors fared little better than their passengers. Jonathan Walker, a white shipwright who attempted to ferry slaves from Florida to the free Bahamas, was ordered by a federal court to have his hand branded with the letters SS for slave stealer. The Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 was without a doubt unconstitutional. 
There were many clauses in that law that were so favorable to the South that freebooters, both North and South, took advantage of it and kidnapped free Negroes and sold them into slavery. In the state of Illinois, bordering on the Ohio River, nearly all the free Negroes were kidnapped and sold into slavery by 1851. Illinois Senator Shelby M. Cullen. Now the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 was a needed law, for the penalty attached to that law was all the hope the slaveholders had of ever recapturing their fugitive slaves. A.P. Stewart, General of the Confederacy. The Fugitive Slave Law in 1850 called upon non-slaves, black and white, to help in the return and the capture of fugitives. If a man is walking down the street and uh, a fugitive runs by and slave catchers are chasing this fugitive, that man can be deputized on the spot and the person would be forced to help in the return of that fugitive under penalty of fine and imprisonment. The Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 was extremely effective in large part because it was so harsh. And the federal commissioners, they work by fees. And under the law, if you decide that somebody is a fugitive slave, you got paid $10. If you decide they're not a fugitive slave, you get paid $5. Now, the logic of this is kind of typical congressional logic. If you decide the person isn't a slave, all you do is say he goes free. If you decide he is a slave, you have to fill out a lot of paperwork. So you did more work, you should get paid more money. But for Northerners, this is an attempt to buy justice. The Northern United States was no longer a safe haven for escaped slaves. And so the Underground Railroad had to expand all the way into Canada, where slavery had been abolished more than 100 years before. Throughout Ontario, the Canadian government and American abolitionists funded black settlements with free housing and farmland. Canada was certainly not free from racism, but here, in 1850, fugitive slaves could own businesses, expect fair treatment in court, and most importantly, they had the right to vote. By the end of the Civil War, more than 20,000 African Americans had resettled in Canada. But getting to Canada was getting tricky, and in 1850, William and Ellen Craft were caught in the crossfire of the Fugitive Slave Act. They had reached Boston and were immediately sent into hiding. They were hidden in the home of Lewis Hayden, a former fugitive slave who, with his wife, Harriet, had provided a refuge for hundreds of escaping slaves. The Fugitive Slave Law came literally to their front door. Slave catchers come to town. Lewis Hayden piles kegs of gunpowder on his front porch and he stands there with a torch and he says you will not take a slave from this building and he threatens to blow everybody up including the slave and the slave catchers and himself up before he will allow the slave to be taken he discourages the slave the slave catchers other blacks show up and eventually these uh, catchers of slaves leave the city while the fugitive slave law of 1850 resulted in the unjust capture and death of countless African Americans. Ironically, it also had positive effects its legislators had never intended. Many people in the North, who had cared little about slavery until then, turned against it. It re-energized and led to the expansion of Underground Railroad routes, and it inspired one woman to lay her life on the line, again and again for the cause of freedom. That woman was Harriet Tubman. Join us tomorrow for part two of the Underground Railroad here on the History Channel.